Our next talk will be by Terry uh, um, Ragstrap from Clemson University. Uh, Terry, I'm sorry we didn't get to meet you in person uh, here at, uh, in Toronto, uh, but I hope that when Sex uh, QR uh, 2i happens, that you'll be able to join us then. Um, Terry has been a stalwart online uh, attendee of the conference. I think I've seen her Zoom file on for almost every day. Terry, take it away. Thank you very much. And thanks for everybody for coming. I am really grateful for the opportunity to participate virtually. I had really hoped to be in person, um, apparently recovering from a major surgery. Do not plan to travel after three weeks. So, so I'm, I'm glad to be with you virtually today. Uh, the work that I'm gonna describe to you today is joint with uh, Jacob Honeycutt, who was an undergraduate student here when he conducted this research with me. He's now a PhD student at the University of Tennessee. And then the more recent stuff is with Jackson Lehman, who was a master's bachelor's degree student here and who will be applying for PhD programs uh, in the coming year. And if you see his application coming across your desk, um, take it seriously. He's a smart, hardworking kid. Um, I want to start with a brief land acknowledgement. Clemson University occupies the traditional and ancestral lands of the Cherokee people. The campus was built by people who were enslaved and incarcerated. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can see more at decolonizecu.org. Um, seeing a lot of uh, geometric talks and uh, number theory talks and with Kevin, some, some commutative algebra. I'm gonna talk about combinatorial commutative algebra. And in this, this area is fairly broad. Um, essentially, one looks at mathematical objects and associates an algebraic object. Um, so, and that's intentionally very vague. In my situation, as you saw in my title, I'm gonna be starting with finite simple graphs on the map, you know, the, the non-algebraic side necessarily. Um, and to that, I'm going to associate an ideal and a polynomial ring. Uh, and I'll set some notation on the next slide in a second. Um, versions of this, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about this at the very end of the talk, assuming that I have a little bit of time, is um, the input that one can take over here, a simplicial complex, a poset, uh, we'll see, you know, a binary linear code, lots of things that can be inputted over here, and then associating to that an algebraic object. And the idea is to study the graph algebraically Uh, or, if you like, to study the, the ideal combinatorially. And this information flow going from left to right is, and right to left is not artificial in any way. The Understanding the combinatorial object algebraically is the fundamental idea with Stanley's proof of the upper bound conjecture for simplicial spheres. Personally, I'm a big fan of this uh, implication. My training is in homological commutative algebra, lots of X, lots of Tor, not a lot of pictures. And it's hard to bring students into that area. And, and it's frustrated me for for about 20 years. Um, and so recently I've been working to, to use this idea in combinatorial commutative algebra to allow students to see sort of high level homological constructions combinatorially, right? So I can see Cohen-Macaulay property inside the graph. I can see the Cohen-Macaulay type. I can see other invariants or properties that I'm interested in by drawing a picture. And there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, in fact, one might say, following one of the speakers yesterday, that it's it's glamorous. Um, so here's the 
the setup and some motivation. So throughout the talk, K will be a field. Um, I don't care what the characteristic is. You're free to take Q bar if, if that suits your, your needs or FP, whichever you like. Uh, v will be simultaneously a set of independent variables or vertices. Um, S will be the polynomial ring using that list of variables and that field. And G will be a, a finite simple graph uh, using exactly this list of vertices. Uh, that's the finite part. The simple part means the edges are undirected. Um, there are no multi edges and no, no loops. So in 1990, Rafael Villarreal introduced the edge ideal of the graph, which is in some sense, the naivest thing that you can do once you accept the idea that the variables can be vertices and vertices can be variables is to take the ideal inside that polynomial ring that's generated by the edges of the graph. Uh, in the example you see here, uh, this is an example I'll carry around for, for the entire talk for a variety of reasons. I have five edges and six vertices, and that edge ideal is generated by the, the five edges. Which ends up being an irredundant generating sequence for the ideal. And the idea in this area is I want to study the graph uh, algebraically by studying this edge ideal or to study the edge ideal combinatorially by being able to identify uh, algebraic information from the graph. And I'll show you an example of that, which is Villarreal. I'll, I'll call it a theorem. Villarreal calls it a remark, uh, potato, potato, um, that for the edge ideal, I can write down a primary or if you like prime decomposition for that square free monomial ideal by looking at the ideals that are generated by what are called vertex covers. In the interest of time, I'm not going to give you a precise definition for that, but the vertex covers are subsets of the vertex set that can cover all of the edges. And this language comes, I would call these maybe edge dominating sets, though I don't like the word dominating in this context. Um, but for instance, in this graph, um, if I look at the three vertices ABC, I have observed or covered this edge and this edge with A, this edge gets covered by B, these last two edges get covered by C. And so, in the prime decomposition of this square free monomial ideal, I have the ideal A, B, C. And one can see that in the generators, every one of these generators is a multiple of at least one of the generators inside this prime ideal. And once you realize that that's the point, then the, the proof of this actually becomes quite straightforward using basic properties of uh, monomial ideals. So there are several ideals in that decomposition. Each one is generated by three elements. And we'll see in a second that that's an important feature of this particular type of graph. So that was in 1990, uh, a more recent- Sorry, we have a question from the audience. Go ahead. Could you go back on slide, please? Okay, so is there, can you say anything about the properties of these uh, ideals uh, generated by these three prime? So are there any properties like, as you said, as you said once, I think they are prime ideals, but do they have, uh, necessarily, necessarily have to be prime ideals? Like these one, yeah. These ones, so the ideals in the, so every square free monomial ideal can be written as an intersection of uh, ideals generated by lists of the variables. And so those okay. will, because I'm working over a field, they'll always be prime. Okay, okay. okay so, but as far as I know, it's hard to um, calculate what is possible. Oh, it's to... incredible. Yeah, that's an NP complete. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, this, we'll say, uh, the, the, so in this case, this also means that, that calculating this thing. 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Uh, so in this case, also calculating this position that you include complete. So my question is, would, would this imply that kind of calculating this position that objects in general would be hard? Sorry, I'm only hearing about 20% of the words you're saying. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I try to, to be more, more audible. So um, if calculating a vertex cover is MP complete, so if calculating a vertex cover is MP complete, this also means that like calculating this, these two positions are, uh, is MP, MP complete. And in this case also, um, like, that, that's why I was asking whether these uh, are primary different positions. So I'm just interested if this is like an implication whether by like calculating prime decomposition or prime primary decomposition. So uh, I got us up to about 80% of the words that I could say. I'm, I'm really sorry. No, it's okay. fine. It's fine. So I think what you were saying was computing the vertex covers is NP complete. Is that does viewing it from the point of view of these prime or primary decompositions help in any way with efficiency maybe of, of finding those vertex covers? Was that the gist? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't believe that it does. Um, it does give, um, it gives another point of view. Uh, for me, uh, computing these decompositions is a lot, I'm much more comfortable with those, whereas for some folks computing the, the vertex covers or these other graph domination sets is, is more natural. And, but it does not help with the efficiency, I think, of, of any algorithms that I know of. Yeah. I can't prove that P equals NP this way. All right. So a more recent um, idea coming from uh, Sharifan and Moradi in 2020, instead of taking the ideal generated by the edges, I take the ideal that's generated by the closed neighborhoods of all the vertices in my graph. Um, so this is the, again, a very naive idea for each of the vertices in my graph. I look at all of its neighbors in the graph and then take the closure in some sense by adding the vertex itself that's a closed neighborhood. And then I used each one of those subsets to create another square free monomial ideal. It's the product of the vertex V and all of its neighbors. And then throw those all into an ideal uh, that we call the, the closed neighborhood ideal. And so for instance, in this particular graph, again, the closed neighborhood of A includes A itself, B, and alpha. So I get the generator uh, A, B, alpha. And then for B, I get A, B, C, beta. And then for C, B, C, gamma. And then for alpha, get A, alpha, and B, beta, and C, gamma. Now, what one notices here is that there is significant redundancy in this uh, generating sequence that A, B, alpha is a multiple of A, alpha. Uh, this one is a multiple of B, beta, and this one is a multiple of C, gamma. So we get A, alpha, B, beta, C, gamma. So what one does not get here is an ir necessarily irredundant generating sequence. Um, but one does get another square free monomial ideal. And just like in Villarreal's construction, the closed neighborhood ideal can be decomposed in terms of certain subsets of the vertex set that, um, that give you combinatorial information about the ideal. These are the so-called, sorry, about the graph. These are the so-called dominating sets. Uh, computing the dominating sets or even the size of the smallest dominating set for a given graph, even for trees, is an NP complete problem again. So computationally, this is uh, expensive. But what the idea is that dominating sets 
what you need to do is you need a subset of the vertex set that dominates every closed neighborhood. So for instance, I could take the elements again, A, B, C. Um, A dominates the closed neighborhood for A, B, F. yeah. And by the symmetry in the generators, there's it's easy to write down all of those, but one of them would be A, B, C again. One of the, the things that I'm most interested in is the Cohen Macaulay property. So, as I said at the beginning, looking at these um, homological invariants of the ideals that are constructed. In case you're not familiar with the Cohen Macaulay property, the way that I think about it is Cohen Macaulayness involves the ideal being unmixed, uh, but then a whole lot more. And Kevin in the previous talk reminded us of the famous Hoxter quote of life being truly worth living when you're in a Cohen Macaulay ring. Um, and so in general, Cohen Macaulay implies unmixed, uh, but for most ideals, the converse fails catastrophically from a algebraic point of view. And, and I don't know if this is true com computationally or not, but it's generally easier to verify unmixedness than it is to verify Cohen Macaulayness. Um, and so, for instance, this result of Villarreal says if you're interested in detecting the Cohen Macaulay property, it's sufficient to verify the, the simpler property of being unmixed. And what unmixed means is it means that in that decomposition that I wrote down, that each one of those prime ideals is generated by the same number of elements, right? So the variety that's cut out by my edge ideal, when I look at all the irreducible components, they all have the same dimension or the same co-dimension, whichever you prefer. Um, here is the first situation where one can see this uh, combinatorially, right? So I'm interested in understanding the algebraic information about the ideal by being able to look at the picture. And this is a constructive um, description of the Cohen Macaulay property that if you want an edge ideal that has the Cohen Macaulay property, then the only way you can obtain that is from what's called a whiskered tree. And what that means is that I start with some original tree, and then for each of the vertices, I add uh, a friend, or I add a whisker, or I add a neighbor. So in this tree T, you can see my original T naught, and then the three whiskers. And that one, so I can look at that, and I can see immediately just from the shape of that tree that, that my ideal is Cohen Macaulay. Um, in particular, that implies some surprising properties about, about these ideals, is that the Cohen macaulay property is independent of the characteristic of the field. In general, for square-free monomial ideals, the Cohen macaulay property is highly dependent on the, the characteristic of the fields, generally with respect to the um, reduced simplicial homology of an associated simplicial complex. Um, but for instance, you get these quick and dirty tests for, for looking to see whether or not your graph has any hope of being Cohen Macaulay by, for instance, seeing if there are an even number of vertices. Do you realize that I have one minute left? Um, derailed a little bit by the my inability to hear things. I hope it's okay for me to take a, a moment more. Um, yes, that's fine. Two, two th theorems, say it again. Yes, you can have one more minute. Thank you. Um, so the two results, the new results that I want to share with you, uh, the first is the result with Jacob Honeycutt. This appeared in volume one of the AWM research journal La Mathematica. Uh, it does the same proof, uh, the same result for the, the closed neighborhood ideal. So that in fact, the unmixedness property is equivalent to the Cohen Macaulay property which is equivalent to the graph being whiskered like the one that I drew here, uh, but it actually implies a much stronger property 
As we see here, the generators partition the variables. That's a complete intersection ideal generated by a regular sequence. And that's not accidental, that the only way that this construction for trees can be Cohen-Macaulay is if it gives a complete intersection. And the last new result um, is one with Jackson Lehman, which is in preparation, uh, where we also characterize the Cohen Macaulay as property for the Cohen Macaulay property for bipartite graphs, um, where again the characterization, and this one surprised me because the edge ideal characterization for bipartite graphs of the Cohen Macaulay is got a lot more flexibility than this, but for the closed neighborhood ideal, again, the only way you can get that is from a whiskered graph, and that automatically implies that the, the ideal is a complete intersection. So again, sort of strongly independent of the characteristic of the field. I'll close with a, a snapshot of some other aspects of this that I'm particularly interested in. Um, the, in particular, the one project that I'm keen on is looking at code word ideals, which give connections with coding cryptography and information theory, uh, and also connections to electrical engineering, where we give a way of constructing electrical power systems where one can solve the PMU placement problem, which is in general also NP complete um, by constructing your power electrical power systems in a smart way. Um, and with that rushed end, uh, thank you all very much.